टीवी और सज्जनों जयपुर शहर का तापमान बढ़ रहा है हम भी जे के साथ आगे आगे बढ़ रहे हैं पर हम समझ सकते हैं कि इस तपती धूप में हम सबकी एनर्जी थोड़ी कम हो जाती है तो इसलिए हम अपनी एक्सरसाइज रिपीट करेंगे जो हम कल से करते आ रहे हैं आई विल कम टू द सेंटर ऑफ द स्टेज आई विल ग्रीट यू विद द बिगेस्ट नमस्कार दैट आई कैन पॉसिबली मस्ट एट दिस मोमेंट इन टाइम एंड वॉट यू हैव टू डू इज रेस प्रोकेट दैट विद एन इक्वल अमाउंट ऑफ एनर्जी मे बी मोर बिकॉज कलेक्टिवली यू गाइज विल डेफिनेटली बी मोर All right. So I am coming to the center and wishing you my namaskar. Project from where you are. Namaskar. For all those who say namaskar. Thank you. Chinta mat kijiye. This is still the literature festival. We will keep that namaskar to the namaskar itself. And with that, we welcome you to the fifteenth edition of the Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by Detol, Banega Swast India, and we are at the front line. We are delighted to introduce. operation x presented by india 75 commemorating the 1971 war between india and pakistan operation x written by captain mnr samant and sandeep unnisan is the untold story behind one of the world's largest covert naval wars naval commando operations x was the directorate of naval intelligence's code for a series of complicated guerrilla operations directed against the maritime jugular of the Pakistan army in erstwhile east pakistan these innovative sabotage missions executed with specially trained east bengali college students were part of india's assistance to the mukti bahini guerrillas in the months preceding the 1971 indo pakistan war sandeep unnisan editor news 9 plus in a conversation with naval historian commodore srikant kesnoor discusses the inner world of this conflict and its many intricacies ladies and gentlemen i will now introduce to you on stage one by one the speakers for the session sandeep unnisan is the editor of news 9 plus although the number of sessions he's done with us is less than 9 <laughs> news 9 plus magazine in new delhi where he writes on national security he is the author of black tornado the three sieges of mumbai 2611 and operation x The Bangla edition of the latter was released in Dhaka on November 8, 2021 in the run up to the 50th anniversary celebrations of the 1971 war. Our next guest, our next panelist for this afternoon is Commodore Srikanth Kesnoor, who in his 36 year old career in the navy has commanded two frontline ships, done numerous operational and float tenures a diplomatic tour of duty in east africa has been involved in teaching and training assignments and has been involved in many outreach activities of the navy he has been the lead writer and chief editor of 11 navy books and monographs apart from many other publications currently the officer in charge naval history project the cmde did his phd from mumbai university and has five other post graduate degrees in sciences and social sciences so ladies and gentlemen this is the second time i'm reading out the biographies for both these two gentlemen and each time i feel like i should just leave the stage and hand it over to them instantly so ladies and gentlemen here we have operations x so i'm so used to sitting on that side today <laughs> on the left uh good afternoon ladies and gentlemen welcome back great to see you all here this afternoon um like sandeep said he was so used to sitting this side and putting other people on the mat now it's his turn to face the fire face the music so to say and let me begin the way he did for those of you who were in the morning session uh he asked an interesting question how many of you have heard of naval uprising of uh, 1946 in the same way i'll ask you how many of you particularly those who don't have an association with navy have heard of operation x well that those small few hands raised a few here should tell us how a very important very crucial aspect uh, of indian history so to say has not been known so far ladies and gentlemen this is 75 years of independence as our uh, uh, mc reminded us just two months ago we celebrated 50 years of 1971 war a war in which the indian army the indian air force and the indian navy 
put up a magnificent display. Now, within the three services, the Navy is known as a silent service because much of what it does is beyond the horizon and not many people know, particularly in places like Jaipur, though Jaipur has produced incidentally two naval CNSs, chiefs of naval staffs. And yes, of course, some people here sitting there. Now within the Navy, you have certain, you know, the silent arms of the silent services, as I call them, they do some wonderful work, but not much is known about them. And Sandeep has unearthed one such precious gem. As was told, Operation X is the thus far untold unknown story of a operation of staggering magnitude. It's fantastic. It was enormous in its scope. It was enormous in what it achieved and what it did. And it had a great cast of characters. And Sandeep has told it brilliantly in his book. It's, it's, it's a kind of thriller that you can't put down, even though all of it is fact. So I would, of course, ask you to read the book. But let's have a, a sort of free reading discussion with the author. He's a co-author. Unfortunately, Captain MNR Salmon, the other uh, co-author, is no longer with us. Uh, but I'm sure Sandeep will tell about him too. So Sandeep, uh, let us hear it from you. Uh, I'll, I'll shoot two questions straight away. One, how did this book happen? And second, um, you are a journalist, you are a master communicator, you can tell everyone here, why was this operation so important? I mean, what, what is the immense uh, importance and magnitude of what the Navy achieved? with this operation. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Srikant, for that warm introduction. And uh, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, someone who's who I've known for a really long time and I ad admire. Uh, and, uh, you know, you are the official naval historian for a particular reason, because you love maritime history so much. And I've seen you over the years. And uh, okay, so the second part of your question first, uh, what is the significance of this operation? Now, the full form of this operation is called Naval Commando Operations X. And uh, the X indicates a covert operation. Now, this is a small little group of uh, men that were handpicked by naval intelligence somewhere in March or April of 1971, several months before the war began. And they in turn selected over 400, 434 to be precise, 434 Bengali youth from East Pakistan, college students, who they then trained as naval commandos. And it's an incredible operation. I mean, they did it in utmost secrecy. And the objective was to sever Pakistan's maritime connect with East Pakistan. Because as you know, the air route had been uh, blocked uh, in early 1971. Uh, there was no question of driving across from West to East Pakistan. And the only route that was actually open was the sea lanes of communication. And this is where the Directorate of Naval Intelligence, they set up a directorate within the directorate, a small group of men that were tasked to sever these maritime lines of communication. And they raised this huge army of naval commandos trained in West Bengal. And believe it or not, on the actual battlefield of Plassey, where Clive defeated Siraj Dola. I mean, that was entirely a coincidence. And these boys, I mean, they're called boys because they're really young, 19 and 20 year old combat swimmers launched a massive attack on the night of 15th August 1971, where they simultaneously attacked four ports in East Pakistan, Chalna Mongla, Narayan Ganj, Chandpur and Chittagong, and sank and disabled over 20 ships. And this campaign continued through 1971. It ended in November. And when they carried out their last operation, they had sunk or disabled 100,000 tons of shipping inside East Pakistan. And so it's an, as you said, it's an operation of staggering proportions. And it was carried out by this very small group of naval intelligence operatives, divers who were sitting and operating in, you know, unimaginable conditions. They were sitting in the back of beyond training, selecting, recruiting, and then launching these uh, combat swimmers, saboteurs. And it's really interesting because this is a time when the Navy did not have a, a naval commando wing of its own. It did not have marine commandos, for instance. Uh, and in fact, this force went on to uh, recommend the creation of the, what we have as the Indian Naval Marine Commando Force today, the MARCOS. Now, this force 
between August and November, they sank 100,000 tons of shipping. And then November onwards, they raised, in fact, a little earlier on that, they raised a gunboat arm as well, which was, again, attacking merchant ships that were coming into East Pakistan. Now, it's really important to understand why they were doing this, because apart from severing the maritime lines of communication between West and East Pakistan, they were targeting the ships that were bringing in arms, ammunition, fuel, and supplies, and food for the Pakistan army in East Pakistan, which meant that every ship that these diverse saboteurs attacked meant that uh, every ammunition ship that they attacked meant there were fewer bullets for the Pakistan army to shoot at the Bengali civilians and the Indian army. Every uh, 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 ship that they attacked that had uh, armored vehicles, it meant that there were fewer vehicles for them to deploy against the Indian army when they finally attacked. And every transport vessel, every steamer, every passenger liner that they attacked in East Pakistan meant that the Pakistan army could not move around East Pakistan when the Indian army finally attacked. So this is a concept, uh, Srikant, you'd be aware of, which the Navy teaches. It's called maritime commerce destruction, which means you target the enemy's supply uh, lines of communication. You paralyze his ability to conduct a war, a campaign. You must have seen it in uh, uh, Ukraine right now. There are a lot of Russian columns that are stuck because they're paralyzed. They've run out of fuel. They've run out of, uh, uh, you know, uh, supplies. And they're actually, uh, you know, uh, held up on the route to Ukraine because they kind of didn't factor in the supplies that they needed. This is exactly what happened to the Pakistan army in 1971. And that is the, the huge... Um, part that was played by this very small group of men. And in fact, they, that one operation on the night of August 15th uh, is the largest commando operation carried out by any Indian force, where be it the Army, Navy, or indeed the Air Force. So it's really remarkable. And the fact that this has been kept secret for 50 years, almost you know, a half a century, that just tells you the level of secrecy that was there in this operation, that the fact that all the people who planned this operation, they took their secrets with them to the grave. Yeah, they took their secrets with them to the grave. We'll come to some of those characters later. Um, but briefly, how did the book happen? The first part. Can you just the, tell us that? The first part. Um, now, this is, believe it or not, a story that I've been following for 25 years. Now, Admiral Mihir Roy wrote his memoir somewhere in 1996 uh, on the 25th anniversary of the 71 war, where he mentioned these operations. He said that the Bengali uh, commandos were carrying out these operations and they sabotaged the East Pakistani, uh, uh, you know, the shipping in East Pakistan paralyzed the ports. But he never let on the fact that it was actually the Indian Navy that was arming, training, supplying and then launching these commandos. You know, it was the, the big picture was always with the Indian Navy. That is the part that he left out. And my reaction then in 1996 was exactly what Henry Kissinger's reaction was in the White House yes. in 71, when he, you know, when that Chittagong attack takes place, those, those four major attacks, he explodes and he's in one of those recordings with Nixon. He's heard saying that, uh, who's training these, uh, you know, uh, naval commandos? That calls for a, uh, you know, military training of a very high order. So this yeah. is clearly the question that I start out. It's there in your yeah, back. It's, it's there One on the thing back. that really stuck me, the blown up ships, and that takes a lot of technical training. I wonder where they got that. Exactly. That was my question. Who was training these Bengali college students to attack warships and uh, merchant ships? Because it's a very highly skilled operation. I mean, it's not everyone that can do it. Where were they getting their explosives from? How were they improvising this? Who was running their gunboats? You know, the, uh, the gunboat navy that they had. Uh, this was what the British called in the Second World War, the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. And this is what the Navy was doing in 1971, believe it or not. So we will be talking about this warfare a little bit more. But there were kind of three actors. Uh, one was all those who planned, and we'll be talking about that. One were the Marine commandos, more than 400, the, uh, the Muktijo does. But there's the Mangro 8. And we were supposed to have Komodo Chaudhary with us today. Unfortunately, he couldn't make it. Now, that's a thriller in itself. How these eight people defected from a Pakistani submarine in France, how they were able to go through certain places in Europe and they were, they were got back and, and how they formed the nucleus of this operation. So many people here may not be knowing about the Mangro 8. 
Why don't you tell them a bit about that? Sure. So uh, Pakistan had bought three submarines from France uh, in the late 1960s. The third submarine was to be delivered to them in early 1971. And it turns out that there were about a dozen crew on that submarine who were of Bengali origin. And that's when the Pakistan army cracked down on the civilians in East Pakistan. After they declared independence, there was brutal uh, repression. They were killing and lynching and raping uh, people there. Uh, you know, it was unprecedented, the kind of level of violence that was unleashed. And this had an impact on the crewmen. So you had these eight ratings on the Mangro, the Pakistani submarine, who decide to defect and go back to Bangladesh. It was East Pakistan then and fight for their liberation. And Abdul Wahid Chaudhary is a very key figure in this. He's a, a telegraphist, a young boy of about 20 years old. I mean, young man. And he decides to, you know, recruit these seven, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, collaborators who then stage this fantastic escape from France. They travel all the way to Switzerland. Then they come back to Spain. And from there, they're helped by the Indian mission in Spain. They're given fake papers. And it's a, it's a complete, uh, it's a thriller in itself, as you said. How they're extracted from Europe by RAW and by the MEA, and they're brought into India in complete secrecy. And they then go on to form the core of this Naval Commando Operations X, this very highly specialized group of people. And they're all submariners. They're very highly trained sailors and uh, highly motivated. And each of them goes on to then form the nucleus of these attack uh, teams that are sent into uh, East Pakistan in August. So you had something like 200 plus of these naval commandos that, you know, simultaneously infiltrated into East Pakistan. And they were, four of them were, all four were led by the Mangro 8, as we call them. And uh, Commodore Abdul Wahid Chaudhary is the last surviving member of that incredibly brave group of uh, sailors. It's on par, if not bigger than what the RIN mutineers did in 1946, because let's face it, all of them risk not only their own lives, but their families as well. If they had been captured, it, it was certain death for them. Their uh, families would have been hounded. They would have been persecuted. They took all these risks knowing what was in, you know, in uh, what they were risking actually. And that's incredible, the story. So the story is not so much about the Indian Navy's bravery, the, uh, the, the professional competence with which they executed these operations. It's also the bravery of these Bengali fighters, the naval commandos, because they risked everything when they went back into East Pakistan to carry out these attacks. And Commodore Chaudhary is the, the prime example of that. One, a remarkable hero. He's a living legend. And uh, he's a, we call him a force of nature. It's, it's just such a pity he couldn't be here today with us. Hopefully, he'll be in another installment of the JLF. Yeah, hopefully, he'll, he should be. And like you said, a remarkable character. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the great thing about this book is, as, as he said, it's thrilling in the way that all of this is described. How, how the Mangro 8 get out from Spain, for example. You can't, you know, you, you just can't put down the book at that time. And subsequently, how he describes. And, and you got this little sense of history by default or design, like it, when you talk of Plassey or, or August 15th for Operation Jackpot. I wonder whether it was a chosen date or, or Samant calling himself as Soman, you know. But one of the great things, Sandeep, and, um, uh, you know, he's, he's described it as the, as the most, um, uh, as the biggest commando operation undertaken by any of the three services, not known. Huge amount of shipping destroyed. Now, more than one lakh tons in that riverine terrain where essentially small ships, not more than 5,000 ton ships go. That, that's a lot of shipping. But one of the great things about this book is that it has this wonderful cast of characters, you know, and, and each one of them brings in such sense of drama. Uh, in fact, both of us are big fans of Bollywood. And I think I, I'm making a very important statement here. I think if this book was made into a movie, it would probably have a star cast bigger than Sholi, you know? So, so what are we talking about? We're talking of Admiral Nanda who gets the permission, the big Mac guy, as you call him, Mickey Roy, the classic, the classic spook, 
Yeah. He behaves, acts like, like Karan Kao, very he, you know under the radar, very won't let his left hand know what his what right, his hand, right is hand is doing. doing. You know that kind of uh, uh, my co-author, Captain he, Summon. Summon. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, you know the incredible uh, story of a, uh, an officer who's trained by the Royal Navy goes on to the Soviet Navy. So he's actually like a bridge between these two navies. And then he comes in here as the uh, on-ground man in charge of this operation. And he hires a pilot, Akuroi. He gets him on board as the launch pad commander in, of all places, Tripura, yes. in the middle of nowhere, uh, Delta sector. And you have uh, his bosses, uh, Brigadier Shabek Singh, Singh, who, as you all know, planned the defenses of the Golden Temple for Bindranwale in 84. It's a incredible cast of characters. And I'm not saying it because I wrote it. It's, it's this, in, in, in many ways, I feel this book actually wrote itself. You know, I just had to do the research and just talk to a lot of people around them. And I said, what fascinating people they were. Here was someone, a, a Navy chief, who inherits the smallest of the services that's never seen an actual conflict. And he, uh, you know, he takes it upon himself to ensure that the Navy does not sit out of the 1971 war. And look what the Navy did in 71. It launches missile attacks with, uh, you know, missile boats that were bought for coastal uh, defense. They use it as offensive uh, striking weapons. They have one old aircraft carrier with a busted uh, boiler, which they repair. And then they, you know, push against East Pakistan where they carry out these raids. And they don't have a, 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 a naval a marine commando wing and they use the divers of the Indian Navy to train this whole group of saboteurs. So, I mean, this is a kind of story of people. It was, it was actually a case of the men behind the machine. It was not so much about the machine as much as it was about these men who never took no for an answer. You know, they were larger than life. They always thought out of the box. And it was like, uh, so Captain Roy, uh, then Captain Roy would say that, you know, for this operation, we need a few hundred uh, subordinates. And Admiral Nanda would say, no, think big, think hundreds. You know, it should be a big operation. And they had actually envisaged this operation uh, to be spread out over several years. So they were looking at a force of something like a thousand plus subordinates. And this is something that uh, no Navy in the world has ever done. Forget the Second World War. I don't think even in antiquity, there is any example of a Navy training Saboteurs of such a uh, in such large numbers and from a small little camp in East Pakistan. So where, uh, sorry, West Bengal. Now, anyone who says that you know you cannot fight because you don't have the right equipment and you don't have this and you don't, uh, you're going to only f- strike when you have everything in place and you have all the you know the fighter planes and the warships and the tanks and all that. You only have to see what the Navy did. It did so much with so little. So much with so little. And one of these great characters, Chiman Singh. Now, Chiman Singh, you, you've described him beautifully. Ladies and gentlemen, the sailor Mahavir Chakra winner, alive. Uh, he belongs to Rewari, a place that has given us many braves, the Rezangla braves, Babru Yadav from there. But Chiman, you've described him so beautifully, Sandeep. He goes inside. He's the only one who actually goes with the, with the saboteurs inside East Pakistan because he's allowed to be persuaded Saab, Ajao. and then being a staunch vegetarian he lives on Moomphali or something like that walks for 23 days comes back he's an eyewitness to the Boira so 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 another remarkable guy and and you got these details wonderfully so can you talk about Chiman and then yeah so Chiman Singh again a fascinating character like you said I mean he was a, a naval diver a very good uh, diver, one of the youngest in the, the core group of Indian naval divers who trained the uh, uh, saboteurs. And uh, he allows himself to be persuaded to cross into East Pakistan. Now, Admiral Nanda's orders to his men are very clear in 71. He says, none of you are to cross into East Pakistan because if you are captured, that's going to mean an international incident. And let's not forget, Srikant, this was a war that was being closely watched by the Soviet Union, the Chinese, the Americans the British, everyone, every power of consequence was looking at this war very closely. It was a global war in, a, in more ways than one. So he said, none of you are to cross the border and go into East Pakistan. And Chiman Singh disobeyed orders. He went across. He spent close to a month over there planning attacks. He is actually the first naval officer, the, na- the first naval commando to operate behind enemy lines. So he's the first. And he's been 
recognized in several ways. I mean, there's a small road named after him. The Chiman Singh block in the diving school is named after him. So he's he's a legend, living legend. Living legend. And uh, so he comes back and on his return, he's actually captured by the Indian Army. And then later goes back into action in the we'll, gunboat we'll, roads. We'll talk yeah, about in that. The raids. Yeah. Now, one of the interesting things that this team does, and again, Sandeep brings that beautifully, as if the commando operations are not enough, all that happens until the run-up to the war, by which time they've also assembled a small, a small force of extremely small boats. Sandeep wonderfully calls them the flower class. And these four boats, many of the people who've been a part of the commando operations get on these boats and do a riverine raid into East Pakistan. Now, we know a lot about Python and Trident attack on Karachi. But not many people know about the Force Alpha. How and you you talked about how there's one of those rare riverine raids right inside enemy territory. Absolutely. So it's why the, don't you yes. tell about? So uh, Force Alpha, which is named after uh, Alpha, is Aurora, General Aurora, and uh, so th these uh, naval uh, 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 the naval diving uh, team, the naval training team of NCOX, they actually operated under the Eastern Army Command of General Aurora. So they were not so much under the Navy as much as they were under uh, General Arora's uh, uh, Eastern Command. This Force Alpha raid is basically two uh, of these flower class, which are basically converted harbor utility craft, which are like water taxis, but they are armed with uh, Bofors guns and believe it or not, aircraft dropped mines. Now these are mines that the Alize aircraft carry and these each of these boats carries four of these mines to attack merchant ships. There are two of these boats and there's a third uh, INS Panvel from the Navy. They go on to launch what is the Indian Navy's only riverine gunboat raid. It's a very specialized kind of thing. You know, navies are normally trained to fight in the open sea, open oceans, near ports, harbors. But here you have a very rare kind of uh, operation which is launched against uh, the uh, riverine targets inside East Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, now Bangladesh is, is a riverine country, more than one fourth, uh, uh, more than a quarter of the country is, uh, you know, it's bisected by rivers. So you had them using these rivers to navigate into these ports and carry out a gunboat attack on Chalna, Mongla and Khulna. And that's when uh, this happened actually after the outbreak of war. And like you said, they could have actually sat out of this war and said, Hamara kaam ho gaya. now we sit and we have the covert aspect of it. And now we're going to sit out of this war, but no. They said, no, we're going to launch one last attack with all our forces. So you had all the divers, you had the uh, Mukti Bahini, you had uh, Chiman Singh, you had uh, 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 Lieutenant uh, Vijay Kapil, everyone, including Mitter. Captain Samant, uh, yeah, Lieutenant Mitter, all of them get onto these boats and they launch this huge attack into Ch uh, Chalna and Mongla. And there's an unfortunate turn of events where they are mistaken to be Pakistani vessels by our own Indian Air Force. And there's a very unfortunate incident of friendly fire. But they do complete that operation. They pick up survivors. And the INS Panvel, you know, it's commanded by a very remarkable uh, uh, war veteran, uh, Lieutenant Commander JPA Narona, who kept his wits about him, steered his ship through this uh, very difficult terrain. Uh, you picked up the survivors, brought them back to Kolkata, for which he was awarded a Mahavir Chakra. And, and I think uh, pro reta, this total force of less than 100 had probably the highest number of awards, some four it's, of uh, Mahavir Chakras. 25. And we... There are about 25 men. And uh, just about 20. The naval component and was naval just com about 25. And we're not counting the awards in Bangladesh. Not the awards in Bangladesh. The naval component was about 25 or 30 officers and men who have. Between them, uh, they've got something four, like four Mahavir chakras, three Mahavir three chakras, ten uh, Veer chakras, Nausana medals. medals. It's possibly the highest uh, number of decorations to, yeah. uh, you know, uh, is it, that's how. Yeah, and, and we name. don't know yeah. Force Alpha, and, right? And, and yeah, that's, yeah, so this is Force Alpha as well. So it's like, that's the Navy for you. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> the you know, run silent, run deep. Run silent, run deep. But Sandeep puts in such enormous amount of detail, ladies and gentlemen. and. And it's interesting in the finicky way in which Captain Saman, even though he is doing daring commando operations, is keeping Pai Pai Ka Hisab. He's maintaining account books. There are wonderful accounts of how All India Radio songs are used to sort of, you know, uh, trigger these commando operations at different points of time. You know, signals. But 
you know, he, he's also got wonderful code names for the way these operations were used. He goes into depth of what happens. But one of the loveliest details that I found, the Pintel plug is one of them, but one of the nicest details, and I'm sure all of you will agree, I want him to tell the story of how a condom factory in South India played an important role in this operation. <laughs> okay, that's... <laughs> so there was a lot of jugad in this operation. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the acme of this entire jugad operation was the fact that they uh, uh, invented a new type of limpet mines. Now, a limpet mine is a magnetized charge with uh, plastic explosives. It's like a... It looks like a pizza with magnets and you stick it on the side of a warship or a merchant ship and after a certain time in the water a firing sequence is completed and it explodes it creates a very large hole in the ship and that's how they sank all these ships now the problem they faced was that you had a soluble plug that was there on the side of this which is designed to uh, you know melt in uh, dissolve in seawater but there was a problem because that plug could uh, would dissolve in about half an hour in, when it came in contact with the water. So uh, they were wondering, I mean, what could you do? Because you couldn't risk the life of the swimmer Sabotia who was swimming with that, you know, putting his life in danger, putting that mine on his back and on his stomach and swimming towards the target. So they came up with this brilliant idea. Uh, it's not still very clear where, um, you know, where that idea came from. But someone said, like, let's just roll a condom over this damn thing. And, you know, protect it till the time the diver gets to the target. And that's exactly what they did. So overnight you had Camp C2P, which is the secret camp that's training the divers, making a very large indent, projecting large indents for condoms. And you had uh, the guys, naval headquarters wondering, why are these guys, what the hell are these guys doing there? That they need, you know, boxes of condoms. And these condoms came from a factory in my native place in Trivandrum the Hindustan latex uh, plant. And they, they were literally thousands of them that were shipped to this training camp and provided to the uh, saboteurs. So when the Bangladeshi uh, uh, freedom fighters crossed into East Pakistan, they were carrying these mi limpet mines, of course, and they carried a generous supply of condoms. And uh, so that's one of the uh, key elements in that narrative. That's one of the key elements. And, and everyone contributed. Like you said, people wondering what they were doing. And typically... It was so secretive that they would not, they would not tell each other. Yeah. So it's everything was on a need to know basis. And uh, uh, now my father was in uh, uh, naval headquarters in the war. He was a young lieutenant. And uh, so my, uh, the first time I read this book, I asked him, Dad, do you know anything about this operation? And he said, uh, Yeah. Well, you know, there was, uh, I, you know, uh, overnight we kind of uh, were wondering what happened because all the Bengali-speaking officers of the Indian Navy vanished overnight. And no one knew where they went, you know, and this is within naval intelligence. No one knew what was going on because they had, like I said, within naval intelligence, they had created another little department, which was kind of training the, uh, you know, the subortier elements and stuff. So this is remarkable. And, you know, to my mind, the 1971 war, so you can't 50 years later, we're still talking about this war. It's like a building at times. I think that it's a building where certain rooms and wings are illuminated, right? You know, there's, there's a room there, there's a light there, but yet there are so many aspects of that. You know, there are so many rooms that are still hidden and that we're still discovering, you know, even half a century later. And this is one classic example of that, that you had this operation, largest of its kind, creates a flutter in the White House. Nobody knows about it. And even in India, once that operation has been carried out, they pronounce mission accomplished. They dismantle the whole thing. The tents are... Uh, packed up, uh, the men are uh, sent back into their service and they're all given their, uh, you know, this undertakings are signed that they will never speak about this. And that's it. Uh, you know, yeah, it's over. Th that's it. Till it came to light, at least some part of it with your book 50 years later. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be very, very happy to take certain questions. We got about 10, 12 minutes. So, uh, yes, uh, uh, the front row and the gentleman in blue after that. Can I face the audience? Yeah, yeah, that's, okay. that's, that's Major uh, Chandra Kant. Uh, uh, I've been very second. lucky that I was an eyewitness to this operation. When the people infiltrated into Chittagong to blow up the ships, unfortunately, Commander Chaudhary, Commander Chaudhary is not here. They infiltrated through Southern Tipura through my battalion. And when we heard the news on the BBC of blowing up of the ships, 
when they were coming back, Aku Roy, whom the Admiral Madhinder Singh knows very well, he was with him in NDA, and the Admiral was in senior to me, but in the opposite cabin in Fox Cotton in NDA. Aku was tall and fair looking. He didn't look like a Bengali because his mother was Estonian. So my men arrested him. They thought they were Pakistanis saboteurs coming in. We were in a place called Bologna, which is in southern Tripura, uh, closest to Chittagong. And Akuroi, instead of just saying that I'm Commander, Aku, uh, Commander Akuroi from the Navy, if something got into his head, he says, I'm Major Roy of the Indian Army. So the first question you ask any uh, officer or anybody who says I am so-and-so, which regiment? Aku hadn't a bloody clue which regiment or anything. So I meant bash him up. They tied his hands and they brought him to me. So same question. He says, I'm, command, uh, I'm Major Akuroi. So I said, which squadron? No, which unit? I hadn't a clue. So I told him and I said, just soften him a bit. Then he says, hold it, hold it. Ask your men to go back. And uh, so I told my men to go back. Uh, but even in parting, they had given him a couple of rifle butts. Uh, Aku says, please ask them to go out of the room. A little hut in the top of a hill. And he takes off his pants and drops them. And he says, see, I'm Muslim. I'm not Muslim. You understand what it means? <laughs> then I said, yeah, okay. Now the thing is there. Then he opens up. He says, I'm not from the thing. I'm from the Navy. In NDA, I was a naval cadet, not good enough ma in math, so Admiral Sampson threw me out of the Navy, became an army cadet. Uh, my colleagues in the Navy had served under him when he was a midshipman looking after the cadets. Major, sir. Yes. Uh, the organizers are reminding okay, us okay, okay, of less stop. time. I, I, but I, I must tell you, I, I learned about this too through your article. Uh, I think you had written in the Salute magazine and I met you in Chandigarh and you regaled me with this wonderful story. So it just tells us how many stories are there to be unpacked. Big cheer to the uh, uh, Major, sir. Uh, the gentleman in blue, the one who wanted to. Uh, short, please. Keep your question short. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You. Yeah. Uh, thank you, sir, for the opportunity. In the era of uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict, how prepared are we uh, for uh, sanctions on US dollar trade uh, when compared to 71 era? That's out of syllabus for me. You can ask Sandeep. Uh, do you do you really want an answer for that? I mean, this is. I like think some, let's let's concentrate yeah, we'll on just, the book and we'll just yeah we'll just keep it to nineteen seventy-one. Let's keep it to this book and. This I'll talk episode. to you after this if you're okay with. Uh, the gentleman at the back there. Yes. Hello. Yeah. So I just wanted to ask because my grandfather was part of the SSB. Uh, and he was also behind enemy lines on the on ground. So I don't know as much about the naval warfare, but I've heard a lot about uh, on ground operations. And so I just wanted to know, was there any connection, like either intelligence or even warfare between the SSB and what they were doing? And then the, you know, the covert operations that the Navy was doing? Uh, yeah, that's what I want to know. That's a very good question. And that's one of the biggest unanswered questions in my book, because I still don't know for instance, where they got the idea for launching these naval commandos, where that came from. And I can only guess because Captain Samanth, my co-author, was at a certain pay grade and this operation was on a need-to-know basis. Uh, and he was the last of his uh, batch of men when he wrote that book. So there were many aspects of this operation which even he didn't know. But what, what he did tell me was that for instance, all these operations were signed off by the political establishment because there were certain operations that were so sensitive that he would go to the Navy chief and the chief would say, oh, okay, I got to check this with the prime minister before I come back. This is because you're talking of attacking international shipping, you know, and he does that and he says, okay, fine, go ahead with it. So uh, because this was a covert operation and because it was entirely need to know, I don't know those answers. Now, the other question in my mind was, again, like I said, where did this idea to launch naval subordinates come in from? Was it Captain, then Captain, later Admiral Mickey Roy's idea? Now, one very interesting character who isn't there in this edition of the book and who I will introduce in the second edition of this book later this year is a very extraordinary army officer, 
uh, Lieutenant Inder Gill. Yeah. Now, Lieutenant, DGMO. Lieutenant General DGMO. Inder Gill, who was the acting DGMO at that time in 1971, was an SOE operative during the Second World War. Now, he had parachuted behind enemy lines with the Greek partisans, the Andartis. Like you, if those of you who have seen the guns of Navarone, those were SOE operation, uh, operatives. General Inder Gill is the person who came up with the idea to train the Mukti Baini. And he wrote that operational paper, which was then converted into an op plan to train the Mukti Baini. And here's where it gets really interesting. Now, this is what later research revealed is that General Inder Gill and Captain Mickey Roy were family friends. I mean, they went back, their parents went back like 40, 50 years. And what are the chances that two very bright covert operators working out of South Block did not meet, bump into each other in the corridor and exchange plans? I mean, this is something that I can only guess at. But like you said, you know, there is a possibility that General Indergill must have used that SOE knowledge from the Second World War and, you know, yeah. told General Mick, uh, Admiral Mickey Roy, yeah. hey, Mickey, there's something you could try out from the Second you know, there's, World War. There's so many success stories that Mickey spawned, right? including possibly the JLF in some way later. That's correct. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're sort of running out of time. Um, uh, how much time do we have, guys? Uh, how much time do we have? Uh, I'll take one last question from that. Uh, Mine is not a question. Uh, I'm a freedom fighter from 1971. I was a student of Dhaka University, crossed over into Agartala. And I was trained by the Indian Army. So for me, please accept a belated thank you to you for writing the book and all the characters in the book. A grateful thanks from a freedom fighter. Thanks, thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that's wonderful what he says. Grateful thanks. And we owe grateful thanks to a lot of people who are sitting here amongst the audience. Many Major Chandra Kant is there, Admiral Madhvender Singh is there, Admiral Bais, and Colonel Ranvijay. Many of these people have taken part in the 71 war. I think collectively we owe a lot to these people for giving us our finest victory. And we owe a lot to Sandeep for the beautiful book that he's brought out. Uh, please read it. Fantastic detail, great research, but I guarantee you will not be bored for a minute. It's unputdownable. And if I may say so, India hasn't produced this sort of war literature that Sandeep has. So go ahead and he's willing to sign books. So please buy them. Operation X absolutely must feature as a part of your reading list at any time. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, Sandeep, for being with us. And thanks to the organizers. And uh, we're good to tell you that we've completed in military style in time. Absolutely. Precision skills with regard to timing. And, uh, and obviously, there's a lot more to comment than just that for you to find, gentlemen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was Operations X. Uh, Sandeep Onitan in conversation with Commodore Srikanth Kesnur. And uh, just to recap what happened, we would love to hear more stories of our war veterans and people who've been at the forefront, at the battleground. It just puts that human element to the idea of war and violence itself, which we need to hear about more and more. So thank you so much for that wonderful conversation. And thank you so much for the audience members for being so patient with the session. Uh, we also thank uh, India 75 for presenting the session. And maybe also request you to accept a small token of our love and appreciation. <laughs>